the technology for a virtual world for the Horrible History series of children's books. Um, that failed for commercial rather than technical reasons, I may add. Um, we've got a Facebook application we did for Little Aeroplane, which is a media company that does a children's programme, Small Potatoes. Um, that's going reasonably well at the moment. Um, and we have some technology for multiplayer gaming, which is our Who's a Relay message server, which I'll be talking a bit more about later. Uh, and we do some .NET stuff, which is not relevant here unless I can persuade them to start using Iron Python. So, why, why do we use Python? Ah, many reasons. W one of the main reasons is, is our development philosophy is agile development. That's how we get stuff done. Um, it's quite very convenient if you're, if you're developing small user stories, small features, one at a time. Um, and you get, it's good to have a quick turnaround of development. You want to be able to um, get the code written, get the code tested quickly, get it reviewed. Um, and Python suits that development model quite well. Um, it has a rich library of tools in the standard library and outside the standard library, and I'll be mentioning several of those that we use. It's cross-platform. It runs fine on Linux. It runs OK on Windows. It runs on Mac. It's been behaving itself today anyway. Um, it's very easy to read, and that's, that's a very important thing because uh, we have multiple skills in our team. We have some people who prefer C Sharp, some people who prefer Ruby for some reason. Um, I prefer Python. And any code review I put in in Python, any of the rest of the team will be able to review that, which is beneficial. We don't have like specialized um, skill sets within which only one or two people can review the code. Anyone can look at the code because it's, you know, as you know, it's very readable. And a great thing is it's free. Um, we don't have to go to investors asking for software licenses because we can just get Python on anything. So what do we use it for? Uh, mostly our server technology on Linux. Um, we, we have our platforms, we generally implement a, an API in the form of REST web services um, because it's easy to access that API from almost anything. Um, we have unit tests for that API which themselves are written in Python. Um, we use it for deployment scripts because we deploy a lot of our software onto Amazon EC2 and we like to do that deployment as automatically as possible. The Who's a Relay message server is written in Python. And this presentation is operated using all sorts of um, Python stuff, which I will also talk about later. So we'll start with the web services. Um, at the moment, we implement these on Cherry Pie, which is quite a good framework, quite lightweight. It's very convenient to use. It works well with mod WSGI on Apache. Uh, and you can also run it standalone on its own server, which I do for like, local testing. Um, before I deploy it out to something with Apache. Um, and basically the way that Cherry Pie works is it dispatches by attribute. So if you have if you have the root of your tree of objects, the URL will sort of walk down the sort of path elements on the URL will sort of walk down attributes of this tree of objects. So what we've done is we define a, a handler class um, and we basically just made the default um, dispatch behavior of that Clander class to try and find a method on the class to execute, to handle the response. And then what we do is, because all we're really doing is writing REST web services, um, if the result of calling that handler is a string of some kind, we just return it directly. Um, if it's anything else, we try and force it into JSON. So we'll the net result of that is that um, all we have to do is just return a value from our handlers, which I'll show you a handler on the next slide. And then if it's a dict, it will get json into a JSON object. If it's a list, it will get turned into a JSON array, and so on. Um, and there, just on the right, there's just basically what you do to make this work is you just create a, an application object in Cherry Pie, give it an object that contains your tree of um, dispatch handlers, um, give it a URL route to respond to, and then a dictionary of configuration. 
So it's actually fairly simple to use. The documentation's not bad either. Ah, don't do that. Okay, so web service example, 90% of everything is create, read, update, or delete. Um, and the way we've written the handler is we can just take the HTTP request method and directly stick a do on the front of it and then look for a method called that. Um, so there's an example of one doing something, um, get a database connection, throw some SQL at it, get a dictionary of the response, and as you can see, we just return that dictionary. And we don't need to do anything special there to handle converting that to JSON because the handler base class already does that for us. So it allows our, um, when we write a new web service, basically we're just creating a new class and we're just writing a few methods. And as you can see, it's only a few lines of code for that, that get. There's a bit more trickiness goes on if you're doing anything that needs to be authenticated. So the put there has, it, the base class has an authorize method as well which does a weird token and hash based authentication thing. But that's really all there is to it. Now for our database connections, we use um, the PygreSQL um, database module, which is just fairly standard DB API2 stuff. Um, you get a connection, you get a cursor from the connection, you do some SQL, you know, you can fetch rows or whatever off the cursor. Uh, and that's very straightforward. Um, but if you want that to scale, if you've got a web service supporting a lot of concurrent users, um, it's far from trivial how to make that scale. Now, um, I, I don't know if any of you caught the, the lecture with the, the Skype guy who had all the sort of amazing things that they do to make their databases scale to hundreds of thousands of users. We don't so far have that, but there's, a, there's some low-hanging fruit that you can do when you want to scale database connections. Um, one is use PG Bouncer. You just run PG Bouncer and give it a config file and point it at your databases. And then you connect to port 6432 instead of 5432, and it just looks like a Postgres database connection, but it can handle much higher load because it maintains a pool of real connections and you don't have as big connection set up in teardown time with each connection. So when you make a connection to PG Bouncer, it's like that and you get your connection, you do the SQL, you let go of the connection and it's like that again because it's pulling the real connections in behind the scenes. Um, and if you really want, if you've got expensive queries, which you generally will have if you're doing anything interesting, it's a good idea to use memcached as well. Um, an example bit of code there, that you just basically create a, a memcached client and you can do a get and, and you can do a set on that cache item. So what we're doing there is if you've got something that's going to take an expensive amount of SQL to do, you first see if you've got it in the cache, just give it a key by which you can find it later. See if it's in the cache. If the answer is none, you haven't got it in the cache, then you do your expensive query, and then you set it back in the cache. Now, what we have found is if you make the length of time that it will survive in the cache too long, you've then got the very difficult problem of figuring out when to invalidate that. Um, and 90% of the time, it's um, a very difficult problem and also not worth the hassle. If you just set quite a short time, say 10 seconds here, uh, then effectively you're throttling your load on the database so that it's never going to be hit by that query more than once every 10 seconds anyway. And that's usually enough for most practical purposes. You don't need to absolutely make sure that it's cached all the time. You just need to make sure it's cached enough to control the load on the database. Anything more than that, you know, go and read the literature. It's a complicated problem. Uh, a couple of things, if you are using PG Bouncer, um, there's a couple of little hacks that we have done we found quite useful. We don't actually create a real connection in our web services. We create um, a thing called a safe connection. I uh, forget why we called it that. But anyway, yeah, I. Um, one of the things is if, you're, if you've got a connection, a database connection open, and you exit from your function and you leave that in a transaction, for whatever reason, PGA Bouncer will not be able to reallocate that connection. So it's basically lost 
in its connection pool, it will it will get garbage collected later. But in the meantime, it will have to create another real connection. So you basically lose all of your um, benefit of using PJ Bouncer if you don't make sure that your database connections close. Now, at the moment, the PygreSQL um, database connection doesn't do that for you. I've requested a patch. Next version, it probably will. But basically, what we're doing is we're just checking when we delete a connection object that if it's got a connection associated with it, and that connection's got a, in a transaction, then we do a quick rollback before we close it, and that gives us back a bit of safety in terms of um, making sure that these connections are closed off properly. Um, we also have a little micro-optimization there that um, we only actually create a real connection when we ask for a cursor off the connection. Um, because our authentication process requires a connection in case it needs to go to the database and find out if you're really a user or not. But it may not always do that, and we also use memcache to cache authentication tokens for a very short time. So it's quite often that it won't need to get a connection at all if all it's doing is authenticating the web service call. So in that case, your connection object will be created and destroyed without ever going to the database at all. Moving on to unit tests, um, we use the unit test module from the standard library. Um, one of the things I know about myself is that I'm extremely lazy, um, although I'm supposed to write unit tests before I write the code, I know that's not going to happen. But if my unit tests are nice and concise, then I will be bothered to write them at all. And that's quite good because it's more or less become a sort of culture of quality at a Tech that you don't put up a code review unless that code review includes unit tests. Um, otherwise. People are going to review it. They can look at the code, but if they can't actually test it, how can they say, yeah, ship that code? Um, so to make this process easier, one handy thing is if you've got a specific kind of test that you need to do, make a subclass of unit test dot test case. Um, in our case, we've got um, a lot of these are just web service calls. So we add methods get, post, and so on to our base class of test cases. And then our unit tests can be literally just a couple of lines of code um, in the case of that one, testing for thing, um, do a delete um, and then do a get and expect a 404 because the thing isn't there anymore. So that is that is a real test case taken from our, our code base. It's just two lines of code to test that that particular feature works. Uh, yeah, mm. you might possibly want to produce XML from your unit tests. Um, in the style of JUnit. Um, there is a Python module that you can find out there on the internet which will let you do that. Um, and one reason you might want to do that is if you're running an automated build system like TeamCity, then you might want to be able to run automated unit tests from that. And it prefers, or I think it only works in some cases if, it can, if you can get an XML file in the JUnit style and it can inspect that and determine whether the tests have passed or not. So you import the JUnit XML, you do the magical incantations. Um, I wouldn't try and memorize that, but if you're interested, you can go and look at the documentation. Um, the only important thing is that if you do all the things and run the test, but don't actually remember to call the stop test run method, it doesn't actually produce the output. <laughs> so your test might pass, but it won't know. Uh, now, automated deployment. There's quite a lot of slides on things related to this. Um, we use the Paramico library um, for our SSH and SFTP stuff. And we find that it actually takes a lot of the pain out of doing this sort of thing. Um, I, will yeah, I will skip over the bit on the left there, because the details of that aren't very important. It's just more or less how you create a connection. Um, how our deployment scripts work in the very broadest high-level view is they just get an SSH connection to the machine we want to deploy onto. And then your Paramico client connection, you, c you can get an SFTP connection from that. Then you can just put, um, Put, uh, what we do is we put just a deployment script, which is itself a Python script, onto that host. And then we do a remote 
command by which we execute that, that deployment script. Now, because we need to test our scripts locally as well as on our destination machines, um, we need a quick way to find out whether you're running on EC2. And the standard way of finding out if you're running on EC2 um, is you go and look at that magic IP address, 169.254, 169.254, because that's where the, the sort of internal web services of EC2 live. And you can very quickly do a quick um, URL open to um, say, for example, that path plus metadata slash public host name. And if you're not on EC2, that'll time out, probably. Um, but if you are on EC2, that'll give you back the public host name of your server, which is the one that is visible outside of the cloud. Um, in turn, there's another one, there's a private host name that's only visible in, on the interior network of the, the region that you're in. But that is very handy. So we just have a script like that on our machines so that when, when they boot up, whatever they have to do, they can quickly check, am I actually on EC2? Because if I'm not on EC2, there's various things you don't want to bother doing because they're just being run for local testing. So, we come to the message server. Okay. Um, when we were developing a virtual world, we had various requirements that you have um, a graphical client running on the web and there's various people are moving around. They've got their little avatars. They can change the clothes they're wearing and so on. Um, and they can chat to each other. And we needed some kind of messaging infrastructure that we could use for that. Um, now, what the industry has generally been using is a thing called SmartFox Server. But that is written in Java. And you have to use Java, really, um, to, to write any sort of extensions to it. And its licensing terms are not great. Um, it's per server licensing tied to a particular IP address, which is not very useful on EC2 because your IP address isn't guaranteed when you start up again. Um, and also, well, pff, we thought we could do better. So, um, because at Who's a Tech we get like 10% of our time to do any research we feel like it, um, I thought, yeah, why not? Let's have a go. So I dug out the twisted documentation uh, and had a go. Um, and so basically, what we have now is we have our Who's a Relay message server, which is a sort of twisted application. And it does almost nothing until you put lots of plugins into it that say what kind of, um, what kind of commands it can handle. Uh, so you might have someone sending a chat message, and that goes into the Who's a Relay, and then it decides who else is in the same room, and then sends out the, a response message to people who are connected to that same room. And that's fairly simple, but because the nature of these plugins, they're just like bits of Python code, they could do almost anything. So chat's very simple, but other things are also possible. So a little bit about how Twisted works. Um, in case you haven't tried it before, um, it is, has a reputation for being mysterious and very difficult to learn, but it's actually not too bad. Um, so I'll cover a couple of the concepts and how they relate to the message server. Um, basically in Twisted, um, the, the thing that does your bit of code, the thing that, that responds to input and decides what to do as a result of that is called a protocol. Um, and it's got a data received method and you, you basically implement that and then decide what else to do. Um, and you create a factory object that can create protocols. So if you create a factory object and tell it the protocol is this, then attach it to, say, a TCP server. Then when the T TCP server object on a particular port, when someone connects to that port, it creates an instance of the factory. Well, it's actually got one instance of the factory. It creates an instance of your protocol, and it gives it a transport that's got the socket that it got from accepting that connection, and then you're good to go. Um, and what or who's a really connection object is, it's really just a protocol that accepts very simple commands. Um, and we decided to do this with just um, carriage return line feed terminated lines of text. 
because then you can sit at your console and test it with Telnet. You don't need any fancy um, software. And almost anything can just open a socket and send lines of text. So it's very flexible in terms of how you operate it. Um, and we have a plugin that does some special handling because if you've got a Flash client on the web and it opens a socket, the first thing it does is it sends a policy file request, which is a lump of XML saying, what can I do on this, po on this host? Uh, and sadly, that's null terminated, so <laughs> we had to handle that a little specially. Um, now, one of the reasons that we developed the, the thing based around the concept of plugins is that Twisted already has a sort of plugin mechanism. Um, anything that, uh, if you make any class that inherits from, um, it uses ZOOP interfaces, but basically any class that implements the I plugin class, which is built into Twisted. Um, if you if you put them in a certain directory and have an, and a mo modules in a certain directory with classes that implement that plugin class and create instance of them as variables in that module, then Twisted when it starts up it will magically be able to find all of them. So if you call get plugins and an interface, it will give you a list of all the plugins it found that implement that interface. And in our case, we're really only we only got one that we implement, which is command plugin. Now, beneath, well, say beyond that, how Huzi really handles its plugins is it looks at the method names in the plugin classes, and if there are various ones that mean various things. So, if a plugin has do underscore say, for example, that means it can respond to the say command. So, you've then got, <coughs> then you've that's basically how you it, you determine what commands your message server will be able to handle is you just implement plugins for them. You can also compose plugins together so that if something, if one command has a, been done by any plugin, another one does something afterwards in response to it, um, which you have by an after method. So that, uh, for example, if somebody joins a room, joins a chat room, um, you might have a plugin sitting there waiting for anyone having joined that chat room. And what it can do is that it can tell everyone else in the room that somebody has joined or it can go and send them a specific welcome message or anything like that. And that doesn't have to know about the plugin that handled joining the room because it's just, if anything, it's almost like an event. And we have some system events like if somebody leaves a room, which is handled differently because they could have left the room because their connection dropped. So there isn't a connection object anymore for that to actually be done on. So you get a system message instead. Oh, don't do that. Yeah, cool. <laughs> um, now, because Twist is asynchronous, the general way that you program is that you you do everything with callbacks, but the way that the callback system works, it, it's quite sophisticated. Um, you have a, a deferred object, and a deferred object is a computation that may or may not have finished yet. And if you attach a callback to the deferred object, then when the object, when the call, the the computation is finished, or the socket becomes available, whatever you're waiting for, um, the reactor loop will call your callback. And if you attach another callback to the same deferred, then what you're saying is the response of that callback is the input of the next one, and so on. So you can like build a pipeline of things to happen when a particular action completes. And you can add airbacks as well. Basically, if an exception gets thrown, it will call the airback instead of the callback. And it, it doesn't mean you have to wait. If, if you, for example, if you have, um, there's a, a built-in thing called maybe deferred, which calls a function with some arguments, and it returns a deferred. But if that, if that function returns a deferred, it will, it will be that one. But if that function just returns a value, then, it's a, then what you get back is a deferred that has automatically completed. So adding the callback just calls a callback. Excellent. Then the final thing is WebSockets. 
Well, now, in, anyone that tried to code their own web socket handling, it's horrendous. Um, the specification has only recently stabilized, and various browsers use various versions of the, spe of the protocol. And um, handling all that is incredibly difficult. But someone um, called Most Awesome Dude has made a module TXWS, and this makes it easy. You only have to add three lines of code to make WebSockets just work magically in your application. I don't know if you can see the number there. It's in pale blue, so it doesn't show up very well on that. Um, but about fourth line down, you import the WebSocket factory. Two lines down from that, after you've created a factory, um, you just wrap that factory in WebSocket factory, and then it magically becomes a factory that handles WebSockets. So that second TCP server, starting on a different port, will now respond to WebSockets on that port, and it will behave exactly the same as far as your code is concerned, whether it was WebSockets or not. And then line three down there at the bottom there, um, you just add that server to your application as well. So we put various bits of these technologies together um, because one of the things we wanted to do was be able to automatically deploy our software on TC2. And previously, we'd been running Python scripts manually to do this. But what we wanted is a kind of push-button solution. So what we did, um, we made um, a server. We put a server up on EC2, which is our Huzu factory server. And it's got a little HTML control panel. And that talks with JavaScript using WebSockets to who's a relay server. And that has special plugins on it. And one of them is deploy. And that can act, what that plugin can do is, in response to a request to deploy an instance, it can call out to EC2, start up a new instance, push the deployment scripts onto it, deploy the software onto it, do initial database setup, and then come back with a response saying, it's ready to go. And I will hopefully be able to show you that. Just log in. This is facing the internet, guys. I'm not going to lose a little short password. Well, that would be nice. I didn't get around to doing that. But in any case, the password doesn't go across the wire because what it does is it uses a, a hashing authentication system. So you need to know what the secret is and then make a hash. And then at the other end, it can look in the database for the, what the secret is, calculate the hash. If it matches, it lets you in. So basically, this is our little control panel interface. Um, if you want a server deployed, you type in a server name. I'm going to do one that already exists because then the deployment won't take five minutes. And I will go like that. So these are more or less just the who's are really responses coming back, sort of slash separated lines of text. And oh, and it's done. OK. Because the server was already running, it didn't have to wait you know, a couple of minutes as it takes for EC2 to spin up a new instance. So basically, all that is is it's done the deployment. And then at the last line, it says, when you achieved, you know, demo one has been set up. If it didn't work, it would have said fail in red. So I'm glad it didn't do that. Ah, so this presentation, yeah, we're using all sorts of Python here. Um, the presentation itself is HTML5 and jQuery. I'm using the jQuery UI stuff. Um, and the presentation is just a series of devs on one page, and I'm making them visible and sliding them in and so on. Um, the Python bit of that is I'm serving this off Twisted Web from the command line. Twisted Web is, I don't know if you, any of you are familiar, like if you want to quick run up a quick web server, you just do Python minus M, simple HTTP server, whatever. Um, that's all right, but it doesn't necessarily handle the load um, if you've got a lot of connections. And we might have a lot of connections in a couple of minutes. Um, but Twisted Web does the job very nicely. So for a quick one-liner, if you ever need to just pop up a web server, that's the thing to do. Just give it path, give it port number, and it's good to go. 
Uh, I'm currently driving it using Who's It Really from my Android phone. Um, if you see at the bottom of the screen there, the little two green lights, the one on the left means that the presentation is connected to Who's It Really. And the one on the right means that my controller app is connected to Who's It Really and is telling the presentation what to do. Um, and this I've done on the scripting layer for Android using Python on that thing. And instead of importing all of Twisted onto my phone, um, I just use Asyncore because that'll do for the, this sort of thing. It's not that, that sophisticated. Just subclassed in Asyncore Dispatcher with Send um, and implement handle read, handle connect. And wrote a little send message thing that basically just takes a list of message arguments and jams them together with slashes in between and sends them. Because that's really all there is to it. And it who's really is very easy to, to operate. So yeah, that's, that presentation was all over the place because I wrote it over the course of several months and then sort of rewrote it in moments of panic. Um, but I'll summarise. Um, this is basically the bit where I'm saying why, start, why Python's good in general. Startups, they often have one-off problems because if you were solving a known problem, you wouldn't be a startup. And you don't have a lot of money because you know, you're funded by investors. You've probably not got any customers yet. You can't afford to spend a lot of money on any technology. Uh, and successful startups, anyway, um, hire adaptable people. If you're working in a, a startup where all the people around you can't just suddenly pick up a piece of Python and some documentation and do something cool with it, you're probably going to fail. Um, and Python and its various packages make a great problem-solving toolbox. So if you have all of those things, you've got one-off problems, you've got clever people, you haven't got a lot of money to spend, or actually, even if you have, just do it for free anyway. You know, dig out Python, see what it's got, um, and you'll probably be able to solve your problem that way. So now, the bit of the demo that might or might not work. If you've got smartphones, and you can read QR codes, and, you're gonna, and that's going to open in a browser that's got WebSocket support, we might have a demo. fair chance to get connected in before I leave the page. Can you connect? If you can't read the QR code, you can just type in that IP address. Um, I see we've got four people in, five. For those of you who aren't already in, you can now see what it's doing. It's a little football game. <laughs> you tap to move to where the football is. If you're standing close enough to the football, when next place you tap, it will kick the football to approximately there. <laughs> uh, what this has done, this is basically um, who's a really, um, and it's using a, one of our standard um, plugins, which is for avatar movement. Um, and one special plugin to control the ball to sort of limit cheating. So if you wrote, wrote your own client, you can tell it where to put the ball because the, the server is actually in charge of where the ball is. Oh, since the time is running up, okay. I, I, suge I suggest we, 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 take, we take questions while, uh, while people, people keep getting. <laughs> exactly, I was going to so suggest no that. Let's, so I'll take questions now. So any question? Uh, 
that's not really Python related, but uh, I was wondering where your investors are coming from. Gen um, generally, they, it's it's one it's just one group of 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 rich men that don't understand technology in London and. Uh, well, and one rich man that does understand technology, which is why we still exist. But it's, it's just one group, it's just a specific investment group. We haven't got multiple groups of investors yet. So it's more like angels? Demons, more like. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what's the reason you're using PygreSQL as opposed to PsychoPG or PsychoPG2? Um, no real reason you probably could use either. I don't think it would matter because uh, either way we're going through a PG bouncer and it just looks like an ordinary Postgres connection. Have you ever tried the Fabric for deployment instead of using directly Paramico? Uh, we have not because we actually got this up and running before we found out that Fabric existed. <laughs> Any other question? Okay. Um, have you any numbers of about how many users you can run on a single relay server? Many thousands, because the protocol is very lightweight, and if if you write a plugin that's very computationally intensive, um, you might have to push that computation out into another thread. But if all you're doing is very quick text responses, we we've tested it to like ten thousand connections, and it's no problem at all. That was on a quite a large machine. If you're obviously running on Amazon Micro instance, you might not get that many. So we have time for a couple more questions. When are you releasing this as a game on the app stores? <laughs> uh, well, uh, when I get to grips with Kivy. So I can do it on Android and Mac OS writing it and getting Python. Um, but the, the Who's a Really so server itself, the development version of that is a fairly free license. You can basically do almost anything with it as long as you're not trying to make money off it. And we also have a, a commercial license which lets you do basically everything. And that's fairly cheap. I can't say how much because I haven't asked. But it's likely to be in the order of like um, £100 or something like that. But the, the development license one you can download, I've got leaflets and a URL that you can go to and get a download of it uh, just to play with. If nothing else, it's an example of how to use Twisted and how not to use Twisted. <laughs> okay, any more questions? Uh, no, just a moment, please. Okay. Uh, I'm just up a noob, so uh, uh, I'll try to... Uh, you're using both Cherry P and uh, Twisted, does that? Yeah, um, we are using just ordinary WSGI for the web services, um, but the Who's a Really product is, is separate. Um, the split of responsibilities in, for example, a virtual world is you might use um, the web services for anything that, that affects state and is persistent and use the message server only for things that are transient, like connections from peer-to-peer. -peer. So they're two separate things. We, we could use a twisted web server to run the web services. It wouldn't be any problem. OK, I think we are. Time is up. So thank you very much. Thank you. Now there is the coffee break, I think. Yes, it is. Hi. It's really nice. By the way, I was very curious about your hair.